Hello and welcome to the Crypto Science Society podcast, a show dedicated to the study of strange and unusual phenomenon and bringing you inside our investigations with us. My name is Jason Cordova. I am your host, and I am very excited to bring to you today a very special episode. It's actually so much material, we had to break it into two parts uh, because it's just that cool. I had the very distinct pleasure and honor of interviewing our special operations agent and folklorist Savannah Rivka, and she uh, recently conducted some field work in Japan, particularly in Hokkaido, and we discussed a number of really interesting things on the side of the supernatural and folklore traditions of spirits and really and magic and monsters so thank you so much for listening i hope you enjoy part one of my interview with savannah rivka Welcome to the Crypto Science Society podcast, a show dedicated to the strange and unusual phenomenon. I'm Jason Cordova, and with me is very special guest, our special ops agent, folklorist, and cultural advisor, Savi Rivka, coming at you from Bulgaria. Stravete, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Stravete. Yeah, that's some of my very, very limited Bulgarian... Like, extremely limited. <laughs> so, how are things going out there? It's been, um, it's been interesting. I'm mostly uh, learning about Bulgarian folk music, um, but also taking some time to visit the villages and see some, see some local sites and learn the history. So, it's been good. Awesome. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of awesome things going on there that we're going to eventually get a chance to talk about. We got to play some catch up here because you are fresh out of Japan and we have been getting ready to talk about the spirits, monsters and magic from Japan. So here you are. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to give uh, folks a little bit of a context, um, what were you what were you doing out there? So um, I spent five months in Hokkaido, which is northern Japan. It's a large, rather large island. It's actually a very big area. And I was in the biggest city there, Sapporo. And I spent an entire semester there uh, as I was finishing my master's degree. And my intention was to do research and learn about the Ainu musical traditions, the Ainu are indigenous people in Hokkaido. And honestly, like I, I've always had an interest in Japanese culture and language, and I had hoped while going there I would have more opportunities to practice the language, which I absolutely did, but um, you know, it was also uh, the the last push to finish my thesis, so uh, that made it a bit intense. Um, but I had absolutely wonderful experiences out there. I was very fortunate to be connected with really fantastic uh, researchers at Hokkaido University. Um, I had a really good supervisor and um, my colleagues in the lab were just wonderful. And, and so I had some really good experiences um, and I made some really good friends while I was out there too. Yeah, you sure did. And I was very fortunate to get out there and visit you. And we got to explore a little bit, and that was pretty awesome. So when I came out to visit with you, we went to a place called Noboribitsu. Nobori, which, yeah, Noboribitsu? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is also kind of known in English as Hell Valley. And it is known to be... It's, I'm sorry, just a correction. It's actually Noboribetsu. 
no Boribetsu. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is a it kind of a tricky language, isn't it? The language is challenging. Yes. Um, but if you get all the vowel, vowels right, it, if mm -hmm. you know a little bit of Spanish, you pronounce Japanese vowels the same way you would pronounce Spanish vowels. Yeah. You got to spell it right too. Yeah, that was that was the issue on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you. So Noboribetsu, it's known in English as Hell Valley. It's basically it's like a it's a volcanic. It's a caldera, kind of. It's a national park, and it is said to be guarded by spirits, or in English they they call them demons. Only. Oh, yep. And specifically here, they're known as Yukijin. It was a really cool place, really beautiful place with a, oh, what, what's the name of that? It's the, the hot spring, the spa. The, the onsen. The onsen. Oh my gosh. Yes, the onsen. Um, so would you mind talking a little bit about these, these beings, these creatures? What do you know about them? The only, um, no, I'm not, I didn't specialize in this. I'm not an expert. Um, I just uh, know like a little bit, but um, it's interesting. Uh, the Oni, in, in many regards, like they're like ogres they're, or giants or demons. Um, they're often depicted as large red creatures with horns. And it used to be that they were like, they would do bad things or be bad luck. But I've, but I've been hearing more recently that the trend or the belief around them is shifting a little bit to think that maybe they, they might bring good luck or, or be somehow protective. And this, this was interesting um, because definitely like when we, when we went and visited Nobori Betsu and we, we saw the depictions of this ogre and they had like a massive, just a huge statue. I would say that was like 100 feet tall or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easily. There was an interesting element of that, of that where it had one face that looked like the, the oni, like the red, the red face with the horns, kind of spooky. Right. And it would change to look like a, a more calm face, an almost right. more human looking face. So I thought that that was interesting. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of statues and depictions of them throughout the park, too. And what I, I definitely got the impression that it was a more of a protective spirit. And I feel like, you know, it's important to distinguish this like kind of Western Christianized concept of demons and hell in this place as the Japanese point of view is a little different. It seems more of like a, a, a protective spirit than anything, right? I think a bit, yeah, it's a bit like that. And the thing about these um, these kinds of beings, typically... The Japanese word that, that refers to the category of like mythological or supernatural creatures is yokai. And mm. so like an oni is a yokai. And I mean, this includes everything from these kinds of demons and goblins and ogres um, and ghosts. And, and just uh, so the thing about them and, and trickster spirits even too fall on kind of under this category is that... Um, yeah, there's there's not necessarily like always a good or bad. There's a lot of gray area. Although some of them are like pretty pretty spooky. Uh -huh. So, yeah. but there's like that's the thing. There's so many of them. Like um, one that's very common in Japanese mythology and stories and folklore is the kitsune. Ah and yes, kitsune. kitsune is very interesting. So kitsune literally. It just means fox. That is the Japanese word for fox. But there's a lot of beliefs around the fox and the kitsune. So um, the kitsune is, is kind of like a trickster. Mm -hmm. But it's viewed as a very intelligent trickster. So you and I know quite a bit about, like, from Native American stories, uh, We there is the coyote, who is, yeah. like, the trickster spirit. And coyote is kind of foolish, yeah, stories are more about showing like the kinds of um, how we can learn from the mistakes of coyote, right? Mm -hmm. That's a right. very specific kind of trickster. Kitsune is different than that. Kitsune is definitely trickster, but Kitsune is is not kind of bumbly like like coyote. Kitsune is very clever mm -hmm. uh, kind of trickster, so you really have to be careful. And and the kitsune is a shapeshifter, so mm -hmm. they can 
uh, appear as human. And many of the, the stories revolving the, the, the kitsune uh, are often depicted as feminine or female, or, or like they turn into women. Um, so, so that's an interesting one. No. And you can see a lot of these motifs like in anime. Uh-huh, yeah. Such as like um, Death Note is a very yeah. popular right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting uh, anime series about um, about a death god or a death demon. It's called a, a Shinigami. Yeah. Shinigami is a kind of yokai. Uh, and it's essentially like a, it's kind of like a grim, uh, grim reaper. But the idea is there's many different kinds. There could be different Shinigami and they all look really spooky. And they look different, you know. So that's that's interesting. That's an interesting one to see. There were a lot of yokai um, that were essentially like demons of dirt. And so they were used to teach Japanese children about cleanliness and that oh. they need to be very careful to clean. And some of these yokai live in bathrooms. Oh, wow. um, and specifically like in the toilet, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> um, well, we hear a lot of this in folklore, folk tales that are they're, they're the cautionary folk tales. Right, right. And cross culturally too, you know, that kind of associating demons with uncleanliness, right? And it could be a, a very like clear connection to recognizing that that kind of thing brings diseases and not healthy situation. Yeah, and in many traditions, actually, diseases, like historically and, and in, in even culturally, some there are some beliefs around this, um, a disease in which a person becomes so sick that they are no longer behaving like themselves anymore, mm -hmm. uh, or an infection, an infection can cause this too, has been viewed spiritually as like a possession. Right. A belief, like an, a, a bad spirit has entered that person's body somehow. Mm -hmm. And and so um, these stories about cleanliness or these beliefs about demons being mm -hmm. in places where there's dirt, you know, and right. that, you know, you can see the connections of how these stories actually take root in reality. They're, they're Absolutely. Kind of yeah. I love it when, you know, like folklore elements line up with science. Yeah. And yeah, and I think it gives credence to other folklore elements that, you know, maybe are yet to be confirmed or determined to line up with science as we know it, right? So uh, I did want to ask really quick, you mentioned the the kitsune, and I wanted to ask you briefly about the shrines, because it's kind of interesting that these, you know, these tricksters, there are shrines dedicated to them, right? Yes, Kind of. That's a bit of a tricky one. So um, I have visited um, a couple of different kitsune tr shrines in Japan. Uh, the most well-known one is uh, near Kyoto. And and there mm -hmm. are just like hundreds, possibly thousands of these um, little fox statues ranging in size from like maybe a small figurine to um, like a life-size fox or even possibly a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. They're very beautiful. They um, they're carved. They're often carved out of stone or made out of porcelain, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they're decorated with red, some kind of red or uh, like a bib or something, which is intended to be like protective and honoring. Um, and uh, sometimes they have a scroll in their mouth. They, now the thing about the kitsune is that the kitsune itself is not viewed. This was explained to me, I should say, by one of my former professors when I was uh, a bachelor's student. Um, and he actually grew up in Japan. Um, and he explained this to me while I was traveling through Japan with him. Um, and he said that um, we were looking, we were going through and seeing these uh, kitsune statues at a shrine. And he was pointing out the fact that they had these like these red like they look like little bibs on them and he said people come and put those on there and yeah. they're not supposed to they're actually not supposed to do that he said uh -huh. they're kind they're kind of not supposed to because to do that implies that it is like a deity and the thing about these kitsune is that they're more a little bit like a spirit or a messenger of the deities right mm -hmm. so they bring they can bring the messages uh or the prayers or the wishes 
in, in Japanese, they often, they won't always say prayer, they'll say wishes um, uh -huh. to, to the deities. Uh, and so that, that's kind of interesting. I did visit uh, the Kitsune Shrine in Sapporo. I specifically went there because some of my friends told me they had a really spooky, uncomfortable, unsettling feeling when they yeah. went. And so I, I was really, I was so excited to go there and, and check it out. But I kind of like prepared myself. Um, because and, and that's... I, <laughs> yeah, that's because cool. the story I heard is that someone went there and made a wish or a prayer, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how you view it. And made an offering because in Shinto tradition you make your prayer and you and you give a little bit of money, right? Uh, like some coins. And so she had some kind of wish that was like, I really don't want to lose anything. You know, it was kind of like, I you know, I want to have some good luck. I don't want to lose anything. And then the next day she like lost something very important and had like a really bad day. Had all kinds of bad luck. And uh, you know, and generally they said they had a really bad feeling there. So I went. And I could see, I could see, I kind of had that sense as well. But before I went, I made sure to like kind of uh, read up a bit more about it. And so I read that um, the thing about the kitsune is people often leave some kind of rice offering because this is, I think this is supposed to be like the favorite thing of the kitsune. Uh, uh -huh. so like maybe like a mochi, a mochi is like a pastry uh -huh. made out of a rice cake. Like it's a rice I cake. I love that mochi. Right, so I love mochi, right? So, um, and and oftentimes as you're approaching a shrine, there might be shops that are selling nice nice things like this so that you can make an offering. So I actually did bring things like this. Um, yeah, you gotta give them what they want. Yeah, I had like the mindset and I went there and um, and I and I made my prayer and I left my things and I I had an okay experience. I also found a really delicious ice cream shop right next to it. So for me it was fantastic. I Magical. didn't lose anything the next day. Yeah, I didn't have bad luck. So that was that was interesting. My friends had a very different experience. Like two or three of them told me they 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 had a, yeah. they had a really bad feeling about the place. Was they but trying I think, to give the kitsune coins? Doesn't want well coins. that is. But that is tradition. That is, I mean, tradition. I mean, in the same way that that the Catholic Church asks for donations, you know, right? Sure. And the thing about Shintoism is, I, after living, after being in Japan for some time, I have very mixed feelings about it. Like I'm very interested in the culture and the religion and spirituality. But I mean, this is built into their system. You mm -hmm. know, it goes all the way up to the emperor yeah and um i think a lot of people are i met locals japanese people who are not happy with it and i mean there are people who are very happy with it and believe in it you know but there are those who are not and who you know see this system as problematic mm -hmm. um oppressive in some ways and sure. i personally as someone who is just like wanting to learn about it I was interested in learning about uh, the Miko, the 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 Miko who are involved at Shinto shrines. The yes. Miko are the uh, young women and girls who would be priestesses. Yes. And um, they used to have very very important roles in uh, Shinto uh, at the temples and the shrine or right. at the shrines. I'm sorry. And this is a very old tradition. And um, essentially. Over time, they used these very important roles that they used to have in society, in the community, have been chipped away at. Right. And now they're essentially like, they went from being viewed as something like uh, they would channel the, the voices of the dead, they would, they would enact, they would engage with a certain kind of uh, possession to commune with spirits, yeah. they, would, um, they would do protective kinds of um rituals very very interesting things and and this has been taken it's been taken from them and and um uh, it's been institutionalized in a way and that the women's roles have been removed and now they kind of they're still present but in a much more just a 
kind of like a symbolic way. Mm -hmm. And mostly they just like will sell things at the shrine and like sweep up or clean around there. So you can still see these shrine maidens, the Miko there, but they're, they don't have the kind of power or they the the same role in co the community that they once did. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing them at the at the Matsuri the, the parade. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, they if there is a festival, they're definitely going to come out. They're definitely going to um, be part of the ceremony. But if you pay attention, as we as when we saw ourselves, it's going to be like two young girls or young women and then just like a bunch of men who are right. the priests taking over all of yeah. the more prestigious roles right. you know um and i know i know you've done a lot of research on that and i remember how like really profound they were they were very uh, very respected and very powerful really yeah they had yeah. they had they 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 were they they had very important roles in the community and they were working on, on all level mm -hmm. levels um, of society. They were they were doing things for the elite class, um, but they were also, um, you know, traveling and offering their services. There were there was right. a, there, there, this role, Miko, uh, was very diverse. There were many different kinds. Mm -hmm. And just that has that has um, really shifted over time. Yeah. And we know from experience in uh, that shift was uh you you found evidence that 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 shift was uh, political in in nature right that kind of power shift that redirected yeah this, this power shift uh, uh, shift absolutely had to do with the way that shintoism was institutionalized um essentially by what what is now like the japanese government but mm -hmm. like i said this happened over hundreds of years and, sure. and again like my research is like I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself an expert on the subject. Um, I'm still learning myself. Yeah. But it's just something that I find very interesting. There was also music involved with with a lot of their the, the things they used to do. Yes. Yes. Now, did that music um, have a key role in the in the spiritual healing rituals in those drawing in of spirits communicating with spirits of that i'm not entirely sure that mm. that i that I, I can't recall but i i do think that when when there are matsuri when there are rituals there's mm -hmm. there's often something something that is some like small even if it's just a small and playing music some kind of percussive instruments or something like that yeah yeah, it, it, it's really, really interesting. A lot of uh, cool, powerful things going on there. And another, I, I, what I think about Japanese culture is how there definitely seems to be integration of a recognition of spirits in daily life. Um, and that even extends to um, things like um, searching for an apartment. Right, absolutely. You... <laughs> this, thankfully, this is not something that I had to deal with myself. Um, but I, this is something I learned about it actually after I left Japan. But apparently, there in Japan, there is something called the stigmatized property, mm -hmm. and a stigmatized property is essentially a house or an apartment or flat in which somebody died in in very tragic um, or dramatic kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, in, in some places, people might view that as something like a haunted house, but it, it, it's different. It's different than this is not like a haunted house because the, a stigmatized property is only considered that immediately after the person has died. And whoever, mm -hmm. it is called a stigmatized property for the first person who lives in it after that. Well, and that's legally, right? Like This is a legal, yes, this is a legal status. We should be legal, clear about that. Yes, yeah, in Japan, um, they have to report that this is the case. Um, and I'll get to why. There's, there's kind of some good reasons for this. 
But but just to explain a bit more, it's only a stigmatized property for the person first person who rents it. Um, and then after that, it is no longer considered a stigmatized property and does not have to re be reported at all. And then but it is just it's listed normally after that. And now that doesn't mean the grudge goes away. Right. Yeah. And so this kind of thing, like the the grudge, um, which was a terrifying, terrifying Japanese film that I did have to watch in one of my Japanese language classes for no other reason than I think my my sensei wanted to traumatize us. Um, and and I, for the listeners, if you have watched the Japanese version, do yourself a favor. And, and don't. Uh, <laughs> don't, unless you don't want to sleep. I, I it, it was rough. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's a similar idea. The grudge implies uh, that uh, a woman was murdered. It's implied that she was murdered and that her spirit is staying behind in this house. And when people try to go near the house or live in the house, terrible things happen because of that. But to talk a little bit more, this is very rooted in reality, to talk about what I mean by <laughs> what makes this uh, a traumatic death. So there is a trend in, in, Japanese, or in Japan of dying alone, which is happening more and more. It's pretty well known that um, the Japanese population is declining. And um, as a result of this, they have what you call the graying of the population. So there are more elderly people in the nation than there are than there are younger people to take care of them and so many of them uh older folks for various reasons are ending up living out the end of their lives alone uh without contact from friends and family uh i think that sometimes in japan it can be hard to maintain social connections and so people for whatever reason are ending up very alone and um, so what might happen in these cases uh, is folks are might die in their home or their apartment and because they don't have anyone checking on them they are the their remains their body is in that apartment not discovered for a very long time and I mean uh, it can go days or up to over a month and what do you think is the longest i don't know i'm not sure the longest um but uh, i was doing some research on this and um i watched a documentary that was made about it and it was like so graphic that they were like blurring out the images because like really there's just a body decomposing uh in there right. uh and that is like when I was learning about this, it was deeply upsetting to me because I mean, this is like, it's just sad. It's it's very sad for me, you know, this kind of situation. Um, so that's one case that might lead to a stigmatized property. And right. and when the when I first was learning about it and, and I saw a, a, a documentary where they were talking about this, they were looking at a stigmatized property and they can stand empty for up to 10 years after after the person has died because, because it's really hard to rent them. People don't want to rent stigmatized properties for obvious reasons, but because they have to be reported that they're stigmatized properties, they're often listed at much lower prices depending on the area, right? Uh -huh. um, but in the, the particular property that they were showing, uh, there was like an imprint on the floor from the body that because it had been there right. for so long. Right. And that is that is like just a very visceral. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Like it doesn't. This isn't like, oh, it's haunted. The, it, there's a mark on the floor and it keeps coming back and it won't go away. This is like a very physical thing. This is very real. Right. Um, because our listeners probably have a pretty good context and idea of what happens to a body after it dies and if you leave it in one place in an empty room for a couple months right right it's it's quite unpleasant and i mean and the other sad thing um very um uh, uh upsetting thing that can lead to because we're talking about traumatic deaths mm -hmm. is um is if some people end up uh feeling very isolated uh, either by choice or by other circumstances and might choose to take their own life. Right. Uh, 
there's some pretty and, high suicide rates out there. You know? Right. So, so that's another reason that there might be a stigmatized property. And so, right. um, that, that, like I said, it, this was one of the more very upsetting things. And, and when I, when I watched the documentary, they were actually interviewing, like there's special real estate companies that deal with just stigmatized properties. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they were interviewing a, a man who worked for one of these companies and First of all, I think he was like a remarkable human being that mm -hmm. he do does this work is really amazing. Uh, and also he um, he's he at the end of it, he said it absolutely breaks his heart that people would even say haunted house. Yeah. And, and that was just really that was really intense to hear because this man works directly with the families of the people who, sure. who just passed away. Um, so that's a very a personal element that you don't think about when you're talking about ghost hunting or haunted houses. Like, who are the people that are directly right. affected by these? Like, these things are real, you know? Right. Like the family, the fact that these were people, these are people, right? These are real people with families and... Yeah. And the dying alone has mm -hmm. become also such a trend in Japan that another that another business that has cropped up is um, because what like I said because these people are dying alone and they don't have contact with their families that means there's often not anyone to come clean up mm -hmm. the person's home right. and their personal belongings or there, there might be family members but they haven't had contact in so long and they would rather not do it so right. there is a company that has offered to come clean up if you have had a family member die and you are unable or would rather not clean up and so they do that um and that was another like just a remarkable human being because that person mm -hmm. actually will clean up the body or, or not the body but because uh, of course the the they come and take the body away but mm. they don't clean everything up that was left behind right from right. the body so this person will clean that up which mm -hmm. for that's very intense mm -hmm. uh, i feel like we're gonna have a, to have a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode because this is, <laughs> this is some well it would be the stuff. first time Right. Um, but then the other thing that I learned uh, that that I did not know about the way that uh, kind of spiritual belief that they have in Japan sure. uh, that I learned through this was that um, uh, that uh, this man, when he his company goes and collects uh, all the personal belongings, if they find any dolls in the house, they take the dolls and they keep them. Um, and he, this man said that there is a belief in Japanese culture, I had never heard this, but he said that there's a belief that all the dolls have a soul. Oh, and so yeah. you cannot just throw them away until you do a special uh, blessing or a ceremony for them. And so they had an entire room of all these dolls. And some of them, it was like everything from like Stitch, like, like the Disney character, to like yeah. these really ornate, lifelike looking like dolls um, and there, there, there are like doll festivals in japan there are other like dolls have have a place in the culture yeah. so there are reasons that people have like the very traditional dolls and so they they do a blessing and a ceremony and all the members of his uh of the company are present for this ceremony and like pray and they bring in a priest and that yeah. i believe it was a buddhist priest I, a buddhist, um, but, yeah. And, and that was very interesting. And when this man and his crew go to a house to clean it up, before they begin, they enter the house and then he prays. He, mm -hmm. he, he says specifically that he says something directly to the person who just passed yeah. to tell them, like, um, don't worry, I'm going to make everything, you know, clean and respectable again and you can... You can be a piece and i thought that that was that was really beautiful beautiful yeah that's really powerful and i'm glad that that's happening right because they're they're cleaning it physically and energetically and they're paying respect to the people which i think is a really i think it is a really good positive way to you know address that and and not getting caught up in that kind of like the spooky 
sensationalist horror aspects of a quote unquote haunted house. Um, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's really good. Well, um, what a great, what a great conversation. Thank you for taking your time away from your research there in Bulgaria, uh, which we will catch up on a bit later to to discuss. And yeah, if anybody wants to contact Savvy with questions or any of us, email us at cryptosciencesocietyx at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening. This, this show is sponsored by Turn a Page Bookshop. You can visit them at turnapagebookshop.com. Check out their selection of all kinds of books, not only paranormal and supernatural stuff. They've got just about everything that you might be looking for. Um, the show is written and produced by Crypto Science Society and its members. The music is Dead Bats on a Wire by their very own Savannah Rivka and Ashley Eve. Graphic design is by Eddie Nori and Heather Metcalf. Sound by Ace Cepeda. Check out our Patreon for exclusive content and good, good stuff. Keep us, keep us rolling and keep the good content coming. Let us know what you think in the comments and email your suggestions. Follow us on social media. Visit the website, sciencecryptojournal, or .wordpress.com. Like, subscribe, share, and until next time, keep questioning.